<laughs> All right. Okay, guys. So welcome tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time to show up. I always, as always, I love doing these uh, team calls at your request. So, you know, as long as we're requesting them, we might as well pick topics, get together. It's just good to see each other's faces, have a topic to, to cover, get your thoughts on it, your experience, as well as share my thoughts and experience. And, um, and then just also bring any other questions to the table that you might have, right? I mean, sometimes we have these topics rolling around in our heads and we can get together as a team and not only uh, me talking to you about, you know, the ins and outs of it, but you can also share ideas with one another. So I think that we've been doing these long enough now that people are pretty comfortable and everybody feels like they can have a voice. And so if you've got things to say, certainly raise your hand and feel, you know, free to jump in the conversation. So I was really happy this time because the last meeting I had said, you know, like put some topics out there beforehand and I'll, you know, I, I like bringing topics to the table, but it's good if it comes from your interest as well, right? Because then I know what you want to talk, talk about. And there was a really high interest on the HRV stuff, right? And so <clears throat> I thought, you know, it's a, it's a good topic. It's worthwhile talking about. There's a lot of information out there. I posted that podcast in on the Facebook page as well as the team WhatsApp. And like I just said to you, it was really, really worthwhile listening to. They do a great job of explaining things. Obviously, he's the guru of it, the creator, and um, and and really explains things nicely and, and puts a lot of uh you know, just a lot of examples and and puts it into terms that I think everybody can understand. So so I want to see from raise of hands. Well, one, we want to see again, just one more time, who had a chance to listen to the podcast prior to? Okay, a few people. Part of it. Good, Ginny. Good. So, and it, like I said, if you didn't, please take the time to listen to the whole podcast right from start to end. And it's pretty long. I think it's almost 90 minutes. So you've got to, uh, even past the HRV stuff, there's really good uh, content in there to listen to for training and heart rate and that kind of stuff. Okay. So with HRV, who here has the actual app and uses it on a consistent basis? Which, I did at one which, time. Which app? The HRV app. So in that, it's called HRV for training is the specific app that they use. So you can go to that, your app on your, um, you know, your app store and you can look for it's capital H, capital R, capital V, and then the number four, and then the word training. And that's the app that they use. Um, and it's, you know, got the most, most research behind it and all the backing and all that stuff. So that's the one you want to download. And if you, you know, I, I think it's worth giving it a try. I certainly used it for a extended period of time, uh, probably a year and a half ago. I just downloaded it again and started using it again as I just got COVID and coming back from illness. So even though I might not use it all of the time, it's good when you're coming back from illness to have just one more measurement. Um, so who is familiar with any any of the you know using it any of the information on it go ahead and so who raise hand who's using it so Volker's using it I, I don't have the specific app I use Rube and Garmin okay so they talk about that a little bit too those are um, those are watches and measurements that they they can be downloaded into the app however all of them work a little bit differently. And sometimes, you know, different ones that record like the aura ring and all that, they can, can be a little bit unreliable because they only take small snapshots instead of you want consistency and, and using the same thing all of the time. So you have to be a little bit careful of that. So if you dive into that podcast, they'll explain that. Okay, so it looks like there isn't really anyone from the team that is used it for an extended a period of time just yet. I, I think, it's worthwhile giving a try, right? And I think there is, so there's a lot of different ways to measure your recovery, right? And that's the main thing. We, we, we know that we add stress to our life. So we have our training stress, which some training, st training stress is necessary for adaptation and growth, right? So there's training stress, there's life stress, 
there's nutritional stress, there's health stress, there's um, environmental stress, whether it's stress, whether it be heat or pollution or, you know, extreme cold, those are all stresses to our bodies. And you can do things like measure resting heart rate every single morning for consistency. Obviously, you track uh, how you feel every day is, believe it or not, a, a pretty good record. Wake up and how do I feel? And that is you work with the HR the app, it actually asks you those specific questions, like how do I actually feel? You can even do something like taking an O2 monitor. Those are pretty simple to get at like a Walgreens or a CVS and take your, your oxygen saturation level every single day. So all of these things, including the HRV, are a way for us to monitor how we're recovering and what our stress is, right? And we want to know that because it's going to allow us to make decisions like, am I getting sick? How am I handling life and stress and the balance of everything? And then we've got to gather all of this information and decide how much of it is worth weighing into the decision of the day of like, do I go forward with training? How, you know, am I actually getting sick? Am I doing really well? You know, they all play into a part of the decision-making process, basically, right? Um, all right, questions so far. Anyone have anything that they want to add to that part of the conversation? We're chatty bunch tonight. You guys are all just like, <laughs> nope, we have nothing to say. <laughs> I, I have a question, Marilyn. Yeah. Um, so like this, this particular app, I when I was doing it, I used a different app and it was a long time ago. Yeah. And and then I just kind of got away from it. But with this app and the Garmin Phoenix, can can you use the Garmin Phoenix to do the measurement in the morning, or do you have to, you know, get up, get a chest strap, put it on, or whatever? No, I think I, I think you can use. Now, uh, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on this, but I'm I'm pretty sure you can use the Garmin Phoenix as well as you can just use your camera on your phone with the app. You don't need to get a chest strap at all. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. To do the measurement or whatever. Exactly. Now okay. I'll give you guys a little bit of an interesting <laughs> fact that that I doubt anyone here knows. It's the only one who might know is Jenny. Is many years ago, um, Alan Cousins. If you don't know who he is, he was part of the Endurance Corner team that I was a part of for twelve years. He's a great sports physiologist, and we're still friends, and we work closely together. If I on some some ideas and different things. Many years ago, I had gone to him and said, hey, I would like to develop something where you can track, and this is before Training Peaks had advanced as much as it had. There wasn't as many detailed um, sort of data entries and inputs and even the smiley faces and all that stuff, but a way for athletes to tell me how they're feeling, right? I wanted to know. And so we do, I developed a, a series of questions. Do you remember this, Jenny, when I used to send this out? Yep. A series of yep. questions and Alan developed it on an algorithm where you could slide it on a scale based on like how you felt. And we felt like those were the most important markers. And every morning each athlete woke up and did the slider scale. And we, he, he made it so that when one of the numbers tipped over a, um, a measurement that we thought was worth uh, being concerned about, it would direct, the, the program would directly email me. And so this was what, probably 10 years ago, Jenny? It was a long time ago. Like we were doing this. Yeah, it was a and, while ago. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so I'd tell people like, take your resting heart rate every morning, log it in your, you know, your training, your training peaks. And then in addition, I want you to do this slider scale uh, measurement every morning that Alan had developed. And anytime something was up with someone, it would email me. So that was, Obviously, neither him or I ever did anything with that. He kept the collection of data, believe it or not, that and he was sort of on the ground floor of the HRV development. But we were doing this kind of thing a very long time ago. So that's just a little bit of history for you in terms of what the goal is when we do all of these measurements, whether it's oxygen saturation, which I used to do with Scott every when I was training with him you know, in my pro career, um, re morning resting heart rate, and then just a record of how you feel all the way to as advanced as this HRV. Now they're talking about HRV being much more sensitive than just morning resting heart rate, right? Like morning resting heart rate, a lot has to happen in, or in order for it to shift. So it's, it's almost like it's 
a little bit late or the number and or as far as sense being sensitive, it's not going to be that drastic. It's not going to pick up as as much detail as the HRV to tell us, hey, you know, by the time your your heart rate is 10 beats higher every single morning, you're probably on your way to either being like pretty dehydrated or sick. Although it tells us a lot, it's maybe just not as sensitive as the <coughs> HRV. Stuff. So the HRV stuff is going to read. Obviously, it's if it's reading high, that's what we're meant to be like, hey, we're in pretty good condition. If it's consistently reading low, that means, hey, we need to pay attention to something. There's some stressors coming from the outside that are, are we need to we need to figure out if this is going to weigh into our decision making on what we do today or how we're going to do things. Now, what I loved about the podcast was that they emphasize that stress is stress, okay? And that could be travel, that could be work, that could be, like I said, all of these things. So the most common thing that you see happen, the most common mistake is people are reactionary. They actually say these words in the podcast, reactionary to a snapshot, okay? That's not what we're meant to do with this. It is a long-term collection of data that we want to see norm right in the same plane all of the time. That in fact, they do go into that it's not only just like if it's low, we need to pay attention. If it's all of a sudden out of the normal high, we might need to pay attention. So it's that we're looking for consistency of a collection of data over a long period of time, not necessarily that, okay, just a snapshot, oh, it's low today. And you know, my my gadget is telling me I shouldn't train today and you have this reaction where you pull the plug on everything. Where this becomes particularly important is one stress can be flying, right? Another stress can be, and they talk about this as well, taking away training. So as athletes, having routine and being able to actually train and execute our routine every day uh, provides you know, a level of, of us being able to function normal and feeling really good. So what happens is all of a sudden we, if we fly to a race, how many people have experienced this? They, if they're using the HRV monitoring, they fly to a race, their training is drastically reduced because they're tapering. They're excited and nervous about the race. And all of a sudden they wake up race morning and their watch says, you need to rest right? Or you're not fit to race today. And they panic and they're reactionary to the, to their gadget telling them that. And what I love, the reason I've been encouraging people to listen to the, the podcast and it's the guy who actually developed it is that he really emphasizes you oh. need to, to be aware that stress is stress and that having just a reactionary to a snapshot is not directing your decision-making in the right way. What you want to know, you have a full understanding of what all your stresses are and a collection of data over time and know, hey, like this is normal. You know, I, I, I went to altitude. I flew to a race. I'm tapering. I'm nervous. You know, I'm excited. I'm worried about my bike. Those are stresses that can cause our HRV reading to go up because it is so sensitive, right? It's sensitive, which is good. It allows us to be more in depth than just resting heart rate every morning and our O2 saturation every morning and just sort of taking a body read. How am I doing? How's my muscle soreness? How's my mood? How's my appetite? How's my sleep? Those kinds of things. But they all play a really, really important role in terms of the, the big picture package on, you know, do I actually need to rest? Do I actually need to just push through this and keep training? The other place it's very important is that sometimes in our life and training, we do just have, you know, if, if you're working 40 to 60 hours a week plus, Christina, <laughs> right? And you're commuting and you live in a city and you're training for, you know, big races, there's going to be a certain period of time where we have to make that call. This is where the art of coaching comes in outside of data to say, hey, it's okay, you're okay you know, yeah, you're a little bit tired right now. And I know everything is reading, maybe, you know, it's going a little haywire, but some of it is maybe necessary stress. And for you as an athlete and as a human being, it's okay. We'll just, we, we can make the call 
sort of together that you're okay? Or where is that tipping point that it's like, you know, I had an athlete recently who is um, normally able to handle quite a lot, even professionally, um, socially, emotionally, and training wise. And their notes just kept saying, and they didn't even realize they were reading this. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I was like, okay, you've said I'm tired for more than five days in a row. So to me that, but what was funny is actually all her readings and watches were normal, but she kept saying, I'm tired. I'm tired. And this is a person who doesn't really ever say that. I mean, they're pretty, they're pretty gung ho on their training and, and do a really good job. And so we, we actually pulled right back and it came up a few days later, they actually had um, a little bit of a, a bug and a stomach bug. And so just, you know, it's, it, I guess what I'm emphasizing is that al although all these things are very good and we do want to pay attention to them, we want to use these tools and apply them to our decision-making. However, we also want to make sure that it's always that um, important conversation between athlete and coach, like, and, and we all have that all the time, right? Like I'm monitoring your notes and, and always after you guys like put more notes in, tell me how you're feeling, because then we can see the numbers, but then we can also say, Hey, how are we actually doing? Is this something that we can push through? It's a necessary stress or, Hey, you're just having this stress because, you know, like for you, Jenny, right now, I bet your HRV would be all over the place because you're not actually able to train. And that would be stressful for you. And so you're not, and, and you're sick, right? And so being sick and not able to train is a massive stress for you. Even if you were just, they even talked about in the podcast that COVID in general, even if you didn't have it, just the isolation period when that happened was extremely stressful for people because they weren't getting their normal social interaction. They weren't able to stay in their normal routines. They weren't able to train as much as they were used to. And so it really affected all those numbers because now- you know, that was stressful. That's stressful for athletes when you can't train. So it wasn't, it's not always, Hey, I'm tired from training. I need to pull back. Sometimes it's something else. So yeah, I was about yeah. ready to blow my brains out today. Just right. Right. You were like, I, I got to go for an easy spin. And it's honestly, like, that's what drove my, drove my, so uh, we laughed earlier about how, you know, I said the doctor in the house never has a band aid, and the coach in the house makes the biggest mistake. But honestly, that's what happened to me. You know, I got COVID. I was isolated for 10 days. And just at, you know, all by myself for 10 days straight. And so soon as I was cleared and my friend said, do you want to go for a ride? I said, yeah, because I really, really needed some social interaction, but an 85 mile ride right out of the gates off COVID was a really poor decision. Right. So like I can laugh at myself and know that I'm like, yep, that's exactly why I do things the way I do. But it was, I can relate, it was very, very stressful for me to be unable to train at all for 10 days, be that sick and be completely isolated for 10 days. Like, no, I was like, man, I need to hear another voice other than my own, you know, I was like, blue, my cat doesn't, my cat doesn't say much to me. <laughs> So, so yeah, so, all right. So I, I've been doing a lot of talking here. I've given you guys a lot of information and I would like to hear from a little bit from each of you. I, I, and so even if you're not familiar with the HRV outside of what I just told you, let's share a little bit with how you, how you're, I mean, I know, but share with each other how you're monitoring your own recover and recovery and making those decisions and handling stress. You know, Ginny, you have a big family and you run a business and you have to manage staff and you train. And, you know, Jenny, you have a ton of experience with when you're, you know, you're CEO of a huge company and training for Ironmans. Everyone here has got so much experience, I think, in this area of having busy, stressful lives with a lot going on and being phenomenal athletes and, and going out and kicking ass in races. So everybody here does a really good job of that. So I want you to share with each other any of your thoughts on the HRV stuff, but just also tips and tidbits on how you personally monitor making some of those decisions and your recovery, like, hey, I'm, yeah, I'm tired, but like, this is okay. I always say there's tired. Then there's like, I'm appropriately tired for what's going on in my life right now and how much I'm doing. And then there's like, yep, yeah, this is probably over the line. Right. So raise your hand if you want to go first. Or I'll I'll pick, I was going to say, or I'll pick on you. <laughs> Who said I'll go? I did. Oh, great, Jenny. Great. Um, you know, I had COVID a year, 
Oh, well, it was a year ago in May. Um, and I would not be surprised if I don't have it now. <laughs> but I have not tested because the girl at work is out and I have no choice. So I've been there, but I've been laying low and staying away from people. And like a couple appointments I've canceled. I don't feel horrible and knock on wood, I haven't had a fever, but I have the cold. And like today I tried to ride my trainer and I could not get in those um, higher intervals and I just knocked it back and rode. But, um, you know, it was really uh, six months after I had COVID that then I had that swimming induced pulmonary edema and then all that happened again. and. I cannot help but believe that that's probably due to COVID and I will recover from it um, maybe down the road and my heart will pump right and all that stuff. But um, I think that fear in me is to getting my heart rate up too high right now if I do have it. And I'm not trying to be ignorant about testing. It's just I haven't had a fever, so I haven't tested. <laughs> but um and I had no choice really about work. Now, if I was feeling really horrible, then I would definitely test because then I would say I can't, you know, I can't go on or whatever. But I just feel like I have a head cold. But there's a lot of people around here that have also had it and had just a head cold. And there's also false positive and false negatives. My grandson did the same thing. I mean, he went to an urgent care and he was negative. He was positive at home. So what do you do? You know, how do you know? <laughs> but um, I would be interested to know how that OT, um, the oxygen, checking that. I haven't done that. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't know. Would that be up or down or what? Um, yeah, it's um, it's a finger measurement. You just put in and it should. I mean, I've got that, but yeah, how would it, I know the reading if it meant anything or it'll whatever? Be down. The number will be down. If it's 100 the Garmin goes okay. continuously. I didn't get that. Uh, the I Garmin 945 I have, it gives it all the time. You either read it continuously throughout the day. And if it's below 90, you have to worry about it, I think. It's about okay, well, I've done Garmin 945 too. And so you just look for that on there and I can. It's, it's on the, okay. it goes up on the app here. Okay. I'll look that up. <laughs> how to put it on, I mean, where I can see it on my watch. It even colors it, it's green or yellow, or I guess it goes into the red if it's really bad. Okay. Yeah, the Phoenix, the Phoenix has that as well, the Garmin Phoenix. Yeah, all the newer ones do. My old 935 didn't have it, but this 945 does have it. Okay, because that's ones. what happened to me in Utah, my um, oxygen went to 80. <laughs> that's when they yeah, pulled 80, me from the water. Yeah. No, <laughs> I yes, didn't finish the race. Yeah. And if you can't figure it out in your Garmin, you can literally go down to like Walgreens or CVS and they have yeah. the finger ones and you can just measure it every morning when you're laying in bed, just the same way you would your morning resting heart rate. And it should, I mean, most of the time you're somewhere between 98 and 99, 97 right. and up to 99. Um, and, and it's usually sitting within that range and you can just record it every morning. So, I mean, that's like, can be in addition to, to HRV. It can be in addition to morning resting heart rate. You know, you can, it, it's a, a combination of all these things that you're looking for consistency of what's normal for you, right? That's the yeah. big thing. It's gathering consistency of what's normal for you. And as soon as you see something that for, you know, over three days is really not normal for you, then that's when you need to draw attention to it. You know what I mean? That's that's the that's a big thing. Well, I hope I'm on the upswing of this little deal right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Someone else jump in here with their um, ideas anyway, and how they should on uh, on recovery and monitoring and making those decisions like hey, I'm really, we've all woken up at different times and been like, wow, I'm really, really tired today and my legs feel, you know really tired or it's, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to even get out of bed and then making that decision, you got to make sometimes on the go decisions. Hey, am I okay? I can just carry on about my day and I'll be just fine. Or, 
actually, this is this is over the line for me. I need to back it right off. And you know, that's usually when someone will get in touch with me and say, hey, Marilyn, I just I really, really can't manage this today. So share with each other here. Let's go ahead. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to pick on you for a second because we're not raising our hands and say like, wh where are those lines for you? What are certain things? I, I some, I've used as simple as like my stairs in my house, you know, like if my knees hurt too much going down the stairs, I'm like, oh, I need to back it off a little bit. I, I'm having to pogo stick it leg down the stairs. That's too much. So share with us some of yours. Um, usually the first indicator is like my, I get really foggy, like mentally, like maybe like the day before, or like, if I can't like shake the fogginess, like a, like a couple of espressos, I'll know that like, I'm getting close to a place where like, I can't manage either it's work, like whatever the balance is, like something's off on the balance or I'm getting sick. And so that's usually like an indicator. Um, and then as far as addressing training, if I can't, there's only been a few times where I've gone to a training and realized it's just, it's just too much. Usually like I have enough indicators, like I'm too tired or I don't feel good, or, um, it's clear that I can't manage the day ahead and I'll back off before I actually get into a training session. Um, and you and I will have a, a quick conversation about it, but definitely the brain blockiness for me. Yeah. And it is, it's a tricky line, right? Because part of training for endurance sports or really any sports is, when you're under training stress and in a high training load, getting ready for a big event, you, you expect to be pretty tired. That's really part of it. It's necessary, right? Like we have to have a lot of training stress. That's the point of it. The training stress goes up, fatigue goes up, right? And readiness goes down. And that's part of shifting you as an athlete to get better. And so, you know, I had a, a, an Olympic cycling coach, you give me a guideline once about you want to start every session, you want to, unless it's like an absolute no way deal breaker, but you want to start every session. And then I always said, like, do one or two reps of what you, you're thinking of doing that day. And then if after one or two reps, your body just absolutely is not responding and it's completely in the tank and it adds up with what you were thinking before, then make the call. Because how often do you start a session and you think, man, I am wrecked or I'm too tired, I'm too sleepy, I'm real hungry, all of these things. And then you get into it and you actually have a great session, right? So we don't want to get... We don't want to get sort of trigger happy with always just saying like, no, 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 because we can talk ourselves way out of even building any kind of fitness that we need or any kind of improvement. If we just are very, I like the word reactionary, right? We're reactionary to every single thing. It needs to be, you know, a, a steady monitor of like, is this normal or is it not? So Christina, share with us a little bit of what some of your, um, you know, bells, whistles, monitoring techniques yeah, I'm uh, similar similar to Jennifer. If if the coffee stops working, <laughs> that's what I know. I know we're in we're in bad bad shape. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I with everything I have going on, I pretty much am in sort of a constant state of of being tired to some extent. Um, so I've just sort of that's that's sort of my baseline. Um, but uh, yeah, I usually you know I try to I try to I try to start everything and see you know see how it goes. Um, and then if you know, for me, I always, whenever, whenever I'm doing intervals, I always know um, the first two or three are going to be terrible. Like they're always, even, even if I feel okay. Um, so I usually give it at least till like halfway. Um, and if it's like the halfway mark and it still feels terrible, um, then I say, okay, let's just, you know, let, let's back off and see. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that, that's one of the things that I try to, you know, I try to, I try to look for. Um, and also the other thing is if I, um, if I'm not hungry, that's one of my indicators too. Like when I get, when I get super, super fatigued, like if I'm just like nothing, no food of any variety looks good or tastes good or none of it, none of it, no matter what it is, sounds good. That's another indicator that I know I'm like, okay, there's something, <laughs> this is more than just my normal level of level of fatigue. So. Right. Yeah. And that is a really good one, right? Like when your body's under a lot of stress, not, I think if we're, if our sleep has really changed, I mean, I know a lot of us struggle with sleeping well anyways, but if it really changes or appetite really changes, you know, those can definitely be indicators. Okay. Something's, something's maybe on its way to being a little bit over the top and I need to pay attention to that. How about you, Volker? You use um, a lot of the measurements and have some experience with it. And yeah. I'm 
And yeah. I, I like your comment about not to be, be too reactionary because I'm using two different things. I'm using the Garmin and I'm also using the Whoop. Uh, both measure heart rate and heart rate variability. Uh, the difference is they have different algorithms as how they evaluate things. Um, they usually differ quite a bit, actually. My resting heart rate is uh, four points higher on the Whoop versus the Garmin. <laughs> Just typically, not always. If there is a variability, the the variability on those on those measurements is huge. A uh, year ago, uh, I was relying on the heart rate measurement from the Garmin, and I, I actually went to the doctor, got an EKG done, an echo EKG done, because I thought my heart something was wrong with my heart. It was going crazy up and down and all over the place. My uh, turned out my heart is just fine, and it's the, it's the measurement which is just inconsistent. And I'm using now the the chest strap, and that's much better. Uh, so I'm I'm fine there. But uh, again, the your example. I mean, I was running New York Marathon, and I was totally in the red before in the morning, and I thought, like, "What's going on?" And I was running one of my better races. Uh, so don't rely on 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 just the 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 immediate. Uh, read out, uh, look at your trends, uh, and I think that's also much more important. And and really consider there is variability in those data. None of, none of those <laughs> things are are very very accurate. Um, it's the same as the oxygen monitoring. It's they are not they are not perfect. And the ones you can buy from CVS or whatever Walgreens or whatever store you're buying, we bought one over COVID uh, for the finger before before I had a nine forty five. Uh, sometimes it just didn't read it at all. I thought I'm dead. <laughs> if I would have believed the data, uh, no, it was it was just this, the instrument was wasn't a good one. Uh, so so be careful when you look at those numbers and, and look at bigger trends rather than and how you feel. Uh, I usually go by if if the numbers are consistent with how I feel, then I take it a little bit easier. Like right now, I'm coming off a race and um, I'm looking at my heart rate and I'm like. To not get it too high right now when I run or when I do things, uh, but next week I guess we're doing a different solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's all really good stuff, and it is, you know, it's it's a gathering of all the information, just like when we train and we use, you know, we we talk about we use power, we use speed, we use heart rate, we use perceived exertion, and you know, I, I think it's and and you hear me emphasize over and over again how important it is to use all of those metrics and be able to understand what they mean in relationship to one another at in different elements, at different points in your efforts, at different points in your training and help you make decisions based on that. Because if you just, you know, what our heart rate does in relationship to our watts is important, right? And what our speed is doing in relationship to our power output is important. And depending on how hot it is, how how dehydrated you're getting, how your fueling is going, um, all of these things play such huge factors. And you've heard me say for over and over again, and, and for some of you for years, that it's just like monitoring all the gauges in your car, right? You're watching the overheat engine, you know, is that engine light coming on? You're watching your gas gauge, you're watching your speed gauge, like all of these things play a part in terms of information for you to make decisions based on where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do. And there's no harm in, like you said, you know, you're seeing that reading with your heart rate and you you know, it was a little bit scary. And you thought, I better go to the doctor and get this checked out. It's always better safe than sorry, right? Like if you notice something weird and you also ask yourself the questions, how am I feeling? And you notice it over a period of time. The best thing that can happen is just like what you did. You took the time, invested the time and money to go get checked out. And they said, everything's fine. You're like, okay, great. That's, that's great. And now I have that information. I think like inf the more information we have as a team, then and each individual athlete and even me as a coach information is power right knowledge is power so the more you have of that if you notice anything that's off it's certainly no harm to say i'm going to go to a good doctor and get this checked out um now in in the same time like you said if once you know everything's fine that helps you make good decisions for yourself you know you say okay actually you know my car always runs a little like, like like this you know some people have exceptionally low resting heart rates some people have very high max heart rates some people have very low max heart rates so it's really what's specific to you 
and and the you know the the gathering of all of that information and then applying it for your best progression and your just best your your best quality of life and health and all of those things right even as you guys saw you know we're I partnered with Inside Tracker because I thought that was a really good idea for all of us for not only performance but our health and I'm always trying to find things like how can we be better and you know it's just one more thing it's more information for us to say like am I healthy you know, how am I responding to training? Am I healthy in my, in my diet and the decisions that I'm making as far as what supplements I need to be taking? Am I just healthy overall at different stages in our life? You know, is there's been some people who have done blood work and they're very healthy athletes eat really well. And they find out just simply through hereditary that there's some off markers in their blood work, you know, for their heart because it's hereditary, right? But better to know up front and have that knowledge and say, okay, well, what can I do about it now before it's a big problem? So that's, those are, it's all of these things are just adding more fuel to your fire for long-term health, better quality of life and better athletic performance. So Jenny, how about you? Um, I think that for me, it, I, I was, I've been over the years, I'm probably outside of Volker older than everybody here. And so, sorry, Volker. <laughs> and um, so I've been at this game a long, long time. <clears throat> and I think that over the years, I uh, didn't realize it at the time, but now looking back, I, it's loud and clear is the things that were big uh, red flags for me were um, getting sick easily, you know, I do something and then I get a cold or, and, and I have allergies. And so that makes it hard for me at times to know, is this, do I have, is it just my allergies acting up or am I really sick or whatever? And and as the stress increased in my life through the latter years of my career, it made training very difficult at times. And, and I, you know, I never, my body just never responded well. I, you know, stuff hurt all the time and I couldn't get over a niggle or an injury. And it just, I, you know, and I just kept plowing ahead, just, you know, flogging myself thinking well what the hell I'm just getting old just suck it up and try to you know do better and looking back on that now I just think I had too much you know in my life between work and training and balancing family obligations and whatever and and so getting sick was a was a, um, a telltale for me and then now that I'm <clears throat> more diligent about monitoring metrics um, my resting heart rate is a good indicator for me too. Uh, like after I had COVID the first time, my resting heart rate was, <coughs> excuse me, 10 to 15 beats higher for six months. It, it took a good six months for that to come back down to normal for me. And um, so that, that's a pretty clear indicator for me that my body's just not ready. And then, um, Volker, you talked a little bit about, you know, the oxygen saturation. That too, I think, is a is a pretty good indicator. Interestingly enough, I just spent about three weeks out in Colorado, and I was up in Breck for a week, up, you know, at about ten thousand feet, training up there. And the literally the day I went, and typically my uh, oxygen saturation day to day is you know, somewhere between 96 and 100. And then the day I went to BRAC, the first full day I was up there, it was like 85, 85 or 87, or it was, it never got into the 90s the whole week I was up in BRAC. And then I left BRAC and went to Boulder for 10 days. And literally the first full day I was in Boulder, it was back up in the, you know, high 90s. It was crazy how that was, you know, impacted. So, it can be environmental as well, especially if you're a flatlander like me going to altitude at 10,000 feet, that's a big change. And so, you know, we have to be mindful of that, I think. But for me, though, those were the biggest indicators, just my inability to shake an injury or my inability to, 
you know, just to get through sessions or, you know, just feeling so tired all the time. Yet I never slept well either. I just couldn't sleep. You know, I just lay there and roll around and thrash around and get mad because I couldn't fall asleep because I knew I needed it, but then I couldn't fall asleep. And I think my sleep was also another indicator when I was, you know, over the, over the edge for me. But I think that's a point. I mean, oxygen saturation is an indicator for COVID, I think, and maybe the altitude as well. Uh, But I'm not sure whether it's an indicator for common cold and stuff like that. I just no, I don't. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah so, I don't think it so. Is we got to look at multiple indicators in order to to get the right scheme. I mean, if you just have COVID, then then yes, oxygen saturation may be a very useful tool. But if we just go just have a common cold or just overtrained, uh, maybe the heart rate is much more important. Uh, the resting heart rate, for instance, or your heart rate while you're training. If, I mean, I'm looking at my heart rate when I'm training. I was running and I ca- I'm coming off a cold after the race and. Uh, I'm fine again, but on Tuesday, uh, my heart rate during the run was significantly higher than today during almost the same run, uh, and and I'm I'm fine again. But uh, it was it was a cold. It was not my oxygen saturation was fine. It was the same all the time. And as yeah. to, uh, Jenny, altitude. You know anything? Um, you're really affected by altitude after at five thousand feet below five thousand. Uh, you don't see too much change. And then anything after every every thousand after 5,000, the impact is significantly more. Um, and so when you're getting up into that 7,000 feet and above, it's, it's quite a lot. Um, and so that, you know, that is it, it, the understanding of altitude or the understanding of heat stress, those kinds of things, they, they play a pretty huge role. And like you talked about, Jenny, what's, what was sometimes is hard about the decision process of things is that the stress you were experiencing through those years wasn't, really as much training stress as it was work stress and so you could yeah, see you're sure. getting less and less fit like if you just looked at fitness indicators and like fitness build in terms of um what you were able to you know do week to week that wasn't actually the biggest stressor so you know this is where it gets tricky as far as managing stress and fitness and that's when it's really important to say to yourself Hey, I understand the total package here. My my life is stressful. And so therefore that might not be the period of time in your life to say, I'm going to do, you know, you wouldn't have done your ride across America during that time. Cause it would have been, you know, like, I mean, impossible logistically even, but like it's, it's saying, okay, well, if I've only got so much stress that my body can handle training, stress, work, stress, life stress, then we've got to say the <coughs> pieces of this pie and where where's the give and take and each person's a little different you know someone like you jenny you have a really high capacity to handle a lot right and so that's going to look different than someone who maybe can't handle that much training or or um you know it's just it's our the amount that you can handle is different for every person and it's also trainable it changes over time right what we thought was stressful the very first triathlon you ever did or the first three months of training you ever did is now you look back on it and go oh I do that every Tuesday you know (laughs) it's like the Mm -hmm. first time you did a hundred mile ride it was the hardest thing you ever did and then all of a sudden you're doing it like every weekend and it's no problem so it also changes based on your exposure experience and as we push that needle on that dial further down the road as well and that's you know when you when you're also a mentally pretty tough athlete and you have been exposed to a lot of really hard training, that's when these, like you were talking about, Jenny, these measurements become even more important because you are mentally tough. You have been doing it a long time. And so, and you're, you can do a lot. So then we say, okay, these extra little measurements that come in, you need to pay attention even more because you're not new to the sport where, you know, the, the slightest thing might throw you off. You're like, oh, I've, I've seen a lot and I, I can handle a lot. So we need to really pay attention to those, those little things. And, and like Volker said, every measurement, the, you know, the O2, the HRV, the resting heart rate, you noticing, Hey, I'm, I feel chronically like I've got a bit of a sore throat or those, my appetites changed, my sleeps change drastically. Like all these things play a part in making these decisions. So well, and I think too, just my, in, you know, I had some pretty substantial injuries in that, you know, having my hip operated on and my knee and whatever. And, 
you know, and just my inability to gain strength back after those happened. And I was so weak and, you know, I, my quads were gone and I just, after my hip surgery and I just, and I'm like, what the hell is the matter with me? You know, I just couldn't get over that hump. And, and I just think that it was just because there was just, you know, I, I had unrealistic expectations of, you know, what my body could handle. And, and had I been more diligent about monitoring some of these metrics throughout that time, that might have been beneficial. Well, it might not might, it probably definitely would have been beneficial for me. But it would, I looked at that at the time. It's, oh my God, that's one more thing I got to keep track of. And I, I just can't do it. You know, I'm full. <laughs> <laughs> when you're full, you're full, right? Maybe that's yeah. an indicator. When you're running around going, I'm full. <laughs> then that could be, yeah. a, okay, maybe I need to pull one little needle out of the haystack here. Yeah. Um, so the good news is I'm, now that I'm not working anymore, I've got all the time in the world. And that's so I can right. get, yeah, I can try to figure some of that stuff out again. So Right. All right, we still have a few minutes left. If uh, Maria, Joanne, Boo, if you have additional comments or things you would like to share, we haven't heard from you yet at all. So if not, if you don't, you know, if you're like, no, I'm just happy listening, that's okay too. But if you have things that are on your mind or that you um, would like to share with the group, Melissa, we can't see you. So I assume that just means you're listening at work. I know you to know that that's, that's probably the case. But um, so yeah, if anyone has additional things here in this, last few minutes before we wrap things up let's let's hear it me i just wanted to share something yeah so uh, this is my second year training with marilyn and uh before when i just started my my highest uh, heart rate was 173 and i know what i've read is that after after you've been you're growing up your heart rate tends to go low it decreases am i right well that's what i read Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you the old as you get older, your heart rate comes your uh, max heart rate for a lot of people comes down, and it's it's depend it depends. It's different for everybody, but yes, the normal is the old as you age, the the max heart rate comes down. Yeah, so that's what I had in mind, and somehow with your magic that you do, Marlene, um, this year it got it has gone from one seventy three no from one seventy five that was my highest now is uh, one seventy eight during training. Yeah. 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 So it went up. I'm like, I'm getting younger. Yeah. <laughs> You're decreasing age. Well, yeah. part of the, so just to understand that stuff, it's part of conditioning and training, right? You get to sometimes where it depends for an athlete, how hard they're, if they're fit enough to actually, those are fitness markers, right? How hard they're actually able to push themselves on their hard training, whether it be Watts or heart rate, or, or if they actually have the strength to be able to go that hard and then how, well, they recover immediately afterwards. So a very, very well-trained athlete, if say they're doing like a three minute effort, they can hit very high uh, speed. If it's a run as, as far as a pace or really, really high power on the bike, the heart rate responds. So sometimes if the heart does not respond, but the power is going up, that might be an indicator of fatigue, a little bit of a uh, suppressed heart rate. So if the heart rate responds, the power is high, then we know that they're able to, to hit that marker. And then as soon as they stop, their heart rate recovery comes. That's why you'll see me put a lot of times in your training notes, we want to actually see the heart rate come back down to recovery or zone one. The fitter you get, the further those separate from one another. Yeah. Right? The, so the maximum heart rate actually goes up this training. The yeah. resting heart rate goes down this training. Yes. So you're resting. So back in the day, like someone like Arthur Lydia used to keep his athletes in 100% base training until they woke up that morning and had a resting heart rate under 40, which is exceptionally low. But he used that marker at 38, 39, 40 as an indicator of planning out his athlete's season. He was training a lot of, um, you know, world-class marathoners and saying if they they had to, and they were running 100, 120 miles a week and just all low heart rate. And once they woke up and their resting heart rate was under 40, then they, he was ready to move them on to their next phase of training. He was, if you don't know Arthur Lydiard, he's got a ton of great stuff. He's a legendary classic um, endurance marathon running coach, a lot of great stuff. But that was one of the things he did. So as endurance athletes, resting heart rate goes down. And yeah, max heart rate goes up. Similar, uh, newer athletes will experience where uh, their aerobic, let's say for the run, their 
their heart rate is very high. You hear this all the time. As soon as they start running, their heart rate's like near their max. And the fitter they get, Christina, you experienced this. You were absolutely a pro at the patients to develop this properly. Like you're a star athlete at this and such a treat to work with because you were so patient, so diligent as far as you trusted me. And I said, look, we're going to run at this, even if it meant walking, we're going to stay under this heart rate for even if it takes a year, a year and a half until we start to see that when you're running, your heart rate stays low. And the fitter you get, that heart rate stays steady and low and the pace actually starts to increase. All of a sudden you're going faster and faster. Your aerobic base pace comes up as your heart rate stabilizes. So this is a whole nother conversation outside of HRV and recovery tools, but those are, and actually they touch on this kind of stuff at, at the end of that podcast as well. So some of it, um, it was nice to hear you know, a lot of these things that you hear from me, you can hear other places from people who just are specializing in, in sports they're sports physiologists. So, so yeah, so those, those things, and that's why I emphasize so much over and over again, we got to watch all of these metrics mean something different all of the time. And it's never just a reaction to one day. Like one day you might go out and have the best threshold session of your life and hit the greatest numbers. And the next time you'll do the exact same session and it might be the worst day you had because you didn't sleep that well or training load was in really high or you're a bit dehydrated or what, maybe you just weren't into it that day. You're like, you know what? I don't really care that much today. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there's all of these things as an athlete, we're not just machines, we're, we're humans, right? So we've got to monitor all of these things and watch the progression over time and how an athlete is adapting and recovering and changing and growing. However, we also want to make sure that we stay connected to the human side of things and say, like, how are we doing? You know, what are the things that we're noticing? If, a, if you see things like if you're a very motivated athlete who typically, you know, is, is and most of us are, right? I mean, I don't think anybody trains with me and isn't super motivated because, you know, that's a tough program. So I, I, I challenge everybody a lot. So you're very motivated all of the time. And if you're consistently, if there's a period of time where you're consistently unmotivated, that's when I, as a coach will say, that's okay. You know, take, take a few days because that's out of your norm, right? I mean, you take really highly motivated people, even if their metrics are all right. And they're just mentally like, ugh, I just, I can't do this again today. Then it's like, okay, well, like go to a party for a few days. I don't know, go to a festival or go do something else, you know, for go fly like fancy kites or something for a few days, play in a river and fish, whatever, and then come back to it. So even if all your metrics are fine, if mentally you're just a bit, bit under the weather, then you need to pay attention to that stuff too. So good stuff. I think does everyone, Boo, you've been real quiet. You're just absorbing, absorbing everything. We're, we're, um, we literally have maybe one more minute left here. If anyone has yeah, pretty much absorbing everything. I, I actually canceled my Whoop membership. I thought it was too expensive at thirty dollars a month. Yeah. yeah. So um, I just used the Garmin, um, and I, I, since you've been training me, I actually don't look at the metrics anymore. Yeah. You know, I just make sure I sleep and get the workout done because I, I I felt like the volume has gone down a lot. Yeah. So I'm just like, okay, it's a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. I mean, the one thing that they talk about too in the in in the podcast that is good that we won't touch on too long here is that each one of these, you know, they're always remember that each one of these gadgets is man-made and they're developing over time and getting better and better. So even when they monitor the sleep, like they talk about certain certain gadgets only take like a 10-minute snapshot at one point in your sleep cycle and that's really actually not enough data to give you good information on your sleep and your sleep cycle. Whereas like, um, you know, the Polar or the Garmin, they're, they're doing a better job and developing them more and more like anything they're getting, they're getting better. Right. And they're, they're gathering information at different points throughout the night and more information instead of just one 10 minute snapshot. So, you know, these things, it's, it's knowing those little details about each one of these gadgets and then applying, like I said, you take all the information and gather it over time, keep record of it, figure out what's normal for you, and then make good decisions based on that. So, Marilyn, I have a quick question yeah. um, regarding the. So I'm I'm intrigued by this this HRV app, this new one, because again, when I did it, it was a long time ago, and I thought it was what I was using was clunky. So yeah. I'm going to download this app, but. Yeah. 
um, in the, in the podcast, and you've mentioned this as well. You know, the, the real key is consistency. Now, for me, coming off COVID again, like, would I should I expect my numbers to get better, like over the next weeks, or like? get lower, I guess, and it'll probably start higher and then kind of creep down. Is that what the expectation should be or the opposite? Yeah, the other, the other way around. So right now, if you start things, <coughs> your resting heart rate will likely be high. Your HRV will likely be low. Okay. And eventually what you'll see as you get healthier is HRV should go up and then we'll find a number that is up that is, um, so there's more variability. That's what that means. That means you're getting healthier and your resting heart rate should go down. If you're measuring oxygen as well, oxygen okay. level should go up. So currently as a sick person, your HRV will be low, your resting heart rate will be high, your oxygen level will be low. I know that's a lot, so I'm happy okay. to like put that in a message. Um, so you should see those. No, that makes sense. And I also did download all of their, when they did the podcast, they have like a series of four articles. They have their site for the HRV4 app as well. You can find a lot of like, they did good summary on all of their, all of the information. It's just good, like, like anything, it's knowledge, right? The knowledge is power. So we take all of this and, and then figure out what's best for you and where we apply it. So, so that should answer. So that you should see that change, Jenny, as you get healthier. We would not expect it to stay the same right now. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, guys. Good stuff. We're just past 5 p.m. now. So, uh, well, 5 p.m. for me in Arizona. So we, but we've been about an hour and I don't, I know time is precious and I don't want to take too much of your time. I really appreciate you guys showing up. I think this is a, a really good conversation and a fun conversation. So I appreciate your input and, and coming Go ahead, if you have more questions or more things you want to share that we didn't get to today, as always, put it in the team WhatsApp and we can start a conversation. Because I, you guys were okay with me recording this, I appreciate you letting me record it. I will, for the people that didn't attend, post this one. Typically, I don't do that. I like people to show up, but I think this was an important enough conversation that it was worth recording and, and sharing with everyone. So once it's posted, if you want to add additional comments or thoughts, or you've had, once you've downloaded the app, if you choose to download the app and use it for, let's say the next 30 days, and you start to notice some things, maybe even share with the group, the things that you're learning and noticing as well. Um, good stuff, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. And thanks for coming. We'll talk to y'all soon. Thanks, Marilyn. Bye. Bye-bye.